Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. We saw some big progress down at Starbase as SpaceX began testing of their booster catch systems while Ship 31 was rolled out of the high bay for cryoproofing. SpaceX also pulled off several Falcon launches, including a record-setting Falcon 9 and a Falcon Heavy mission. China also conducted two rocket launches, one was intentional and one was not intentional. SpaceX were contracted to deorbit the ISS, hopefully after Boeing Starliner has the chance to leave as inspections continue on the vehicle, which has remained docked to the station for far longer than planned. Japan conducted the first operational launch of their H3 rocket and much, much more. Enjoy. Starbase is busy as ever as SpaceX work towards three major milestones. The launch of Starship Integrated Flight Test 5, the first ever catch attempt of a super heavy first stage, and the construction of Orbital Launch Pad 2. To begin with that last one there, we've seen the delivery of yet more components for the launch tower, arriving by barge, and look, among them we can see catch arm hardware. Exciting to see things come together. We also have the raising of the gigantic CC8800-1 crane, which will stack everything together. Here's a great time lapse of the yellow giant rise up for the very first time. This thing is absolutely gigantic. And here's a photo to give some scale of it next to the existing launch tower. This photo was taken by Starbase Surfer, who last week also shared this rather profound image of a 150-year-old shipwreck in the shadows of the launch tower. Can you imagine how people who built this ship would react to the ships we're currently building at Boca Chica? This is such a cool photo. In another 150 years, who knows what things will look like? Blue Origin may have even reached orbit by that stage. <laughs> but yes, it's very exciting to see how much progress has been made at such high pace at the second orbital launch site. It's going to be so surreal to see two launch and catch towers at Boca Chica. SpaceX are working hard towards readiness for Starship Flight Test 5. Ship 30 remains swarmed by scaffolding as workers continue the total removal and replacement of its heat shield so that it doesn't sustain quite as much damage as Ship 29 did during its re-entry. Of course, the most exciting aspect of Flight 5 will be the first ever catch attempt of a Super Heavy booster in the jaws of the chopsticks. Whether it succeeds or not, both potential outcomes for this will carry guaranteed excitement. To prepare for this momentous catch attempt, SpaceX are currently running some tests with a structural prototype on the launch pad. In last Monday's episode of Space This Week, I covered the craning of this tank into the launch pad, but we weren't really sure what the catch tests themselves would look like. I speculated that the tank might get filled with water to simulate the mass of a landing booster and the chopsticks to try and lift it and move it around, but that isn't what happened. Instead, SpaceX just sort of slapped the booster. I guess. <laughs> okay, but for real, they appear to be testing getting the chopsticks to quickly snap from being open to closed in the right position to catch the booster, achieving both high enough accuracy and sufficient closure speed for a safe catch will be difficult, especially when considering the sheer size of the claws, and so all these tests are likely in service of calibrating the catch system before a live flight vehicle comes hurtling towards the pad. Whether or not we'll see any further testing, such as the aforementioned lift test, remains to be seen. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. If I were to wager though, I'd say that SpaceX are done for now, as the test tank was later removed from the launch mount entirely. There is still a possibility that it'll be reinstalled later though, so watch this space. As mentioned earlier, Ship 30 is having its entire heat shield replaced, and as for its successor, Ship 31, last night it was lifted onto a ship transporter stand and left the high bay, heading off down the road to the Macy's site for cryo testing. We saw some pretty amazing stuff from SpaceX's Falcon fleet last week, including a record-setting Falcon 9 launch and another outing of the always exciting Falcon Heavy. Two of the Falcon 9 launches of the week were for Starlink, the first launching on Monday from Vandenberg, and the other on Thursday from Cape Canaveral. Both missions were successful, and both boosters made successful landings following second stage separation. Thursday's landing was a particularly special one, as this landing was by the current fleet leader B-1062, which now has a staggering 22 launches to its name. I wonder how far SpaceX will be able to keep reflying it. 
Interestingly, if it manages another two launches, then this one single Falcon 9 first stage will have performed more launches than the entirety of Blue Origin's fleet of new Shepherds. Though even the newest Falcon 9 boosters, 1072 and 1086, which have only flown once, still have more orbital launches to their name than the whole of Blue Origin. <laughs> Hey, you know, speaking of Blue Origin, they have filed a comment to the FAA saying that the number of Starship launches from Cape Canaveral should be capped due to impact on local environment. Now, I don't know about you, but considering that the local environment is arguably the most famous rocket launch site that has been actively launching stuff for well over half a century, Starship probably won't have that great of an impact. Elon commented that this is an obviously disingenuous response and that this is the third time Blue Origin has attempted to impede SpaceX's progress by lawfare. Poor Blue Origin. If you don't know, they were actually founded two years earlier than SpaceX, yet still have not reached orbit. New Shepard is very cool now, don't get me wrong, having a crew rated space vehicle and a self landing booster is no small feat, but also, come on Jeff, you know? <laughs> Anyway, circling back to the newest Falcon 9 boosters, the first and so far only flights for Falcon boosters 1086 and 1072 was last week actually. Together, they formed the Falcon Heavy side boosters for last Tuesday's launch, which carried the final mission in the NASA's GO satellite series. See what I did there? I said the NASA's rather than just NASA's because when writing this video's script, I somehow only just realized that the NASA's is the grammatically correct way of wording that rather than just NASA's. And yet, it just doesn't sit well with me, you know? Like, we say the FAA and the CIA, the EPA, yet we just say NASA. And to be honest, I'm never going to say the NASA because it just sounds wrong. Do you agree with me? I hope so. Anyway, weird tangent aside, the rocket carried the GOES U weather satellite to geosynchronous orbit, where it'll be operated by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. In addition to being a weather satellite, the GOES U is also fitted with a coronagraph instrument, which will allow continued monitoring of solar wind after NASA retires its solar and heliospheric observatory satellite in 2025. And back down on Earth, we were of course treated to the always fun to see landing of the two Falcon Heavy side boosters. The core was expended as planned with no landing attempt made, as is normal for how SpaceX operate Falcon Heavy these days. One other interesting thing to note about this Falcon Heavy was the grey stripe on the second stage. We sometimes see this with Falcon 9 as well. The purpose of the stripe is to improve the thermals in the stage to maintain better temperatures inside the propellant tanks. It, and a few other modifications, help prevent the fuel from freezing during longer orbital missions such as this one. The other Falcon mission we saw launch last week was on Saturday. This was the NROL-186 mission, which carried what we believe to be 20 Star Shield satellites to low Earth orbit. Star Shield is the military version of SpaceX's Starlink, but beyond this, very little is known about the satellites themselves. They're built by SpaceX with collaboration from Northrop Grumman, and while they are very similar in function to Starlink, they also have some additional functions related to target tracking, optical and radio reconnaissance, and early missile warning. Last week's launch was the second of six dedicated launches to build out the Starshield network. We weren't expecting a Tianlong 3Y1 launch last week. Its builder, Chinese firm Space Pioneer, intended to conduct a static fire of its first stage. Here it is being photographed ahead of this. However, there was something that you might describe as a catastrophic failure of the test stand, as the rocket actually took off during the test. On screen is stuff filmed by civilians near the area, since I doubt we will ever get an official video of the mishap. Given that the rocket was meant to just do a static fire, there was no upper stage, or even aerodynamic nose cone, or flight termination system, or flight plan at all, so all people could really do was just watch what happened. It went up for a bit, but then started losing control, well, not that it ever had control, before hurtling into the surrounding hills and exploding in dramatic fashion. What a mishap indeed. This isn't actually the first time this has happened though. In 1952, the US conducted a static fire test of Viking 8, which resulted in the rocket tearing free from the pad, reaching 20,000 feet in altitude and impacting 4 to 5 miles away. Sadly, no one in the area had an iPhone handy to video this, so you'll have to just use your imagination to visualize how that may have looked. 
China did pull off an intentional rocket launch last week though, on Saturday that was luckily more successful. This was a Long March 7A carrying the ChinaSat 3A communication satellite to geosynchronous orbit, and yes, the, uh, the mission was a success. Earlier today, we saw the very first operational flight of Japan's H-3 rocket. The vehicle lifted off from the Tanegashima Space Center, carrying the ALOS-4 satellite to low Earth orbit. ALOS-4 will replace the aging ALOS-2, which was launched in 2014, and its name is an acronym that stands for Advanced Land Observing Satellite. It's a synthetic aperture radar satellite that will play an important role in disaster mitigation efforts, not only in grasping the situation when a disaster occurs, but also in early detection of abnormalities such as volcanic activity, land subsidence, and landslides. Starliner is still docked to the International Space Station, even though the original mission schedule would have seen it return to Earth quite a while ago now, because of ongoing inspections and testing of its thrusters. I do think most of the media is being a bit hyperbolic by claiming that Butch and Sonny are stranded there though. The spacecraft is easily capable of returning to Earth. The problem is that the issues are with the spacecraft service module, which is the white cylindrical part that sits below the heat shield. Here's the capsule being mated to it, which is also discarded on re-entry and isn't recovered. So the only way these problems can be inspected and learning can be had is by studying it now while it's docked to the station. But NASA are actively investigating problems and there is a non-zero chance that they will deem the spacecraft unsafe to return the astronauts back to Earth, in which case a SpaceX Dragon will most likely be used as a replacement, perhaps with the next crew mission launching with just two astronauts to make room for Sonny and Butch. It'll be interesting to see how this all eventually plays out. Right now, NASA's official stance is that they've designated the Starliner safe only for emergency returns, not non-emergency. An emergency situation for the ISS could include scenarios of there being concerns of a collision with space debris that could destroy the station. But eventually, this is something that will need to happen anyway. The aging station is starting to manifest evidence of its near three decades in space, and NASA has given SpaceX the task of developing a special spacecraft that'll dock with the station in 2029 and deorbit the entire thing by 2030. I stole this picture of Starship deorbiting it from Reddit. The real operation will of course look nothing like this picture, but hey, would be pretty cool if it did, right? <laughs> I guess one realistic thing about this picture is that Starliner is still docked to the Harmony module. Uh, hopefully engineers can figure out those valves before it burns up during re-entry here. <laughs> For real, I don't know what sort of vehicle will perform the deorbit. It may be a specially modified Starship, or a modified Cargo Dragon, or even a Dragon XL, or something else entirely. After collecting lunar surface samples, China's Chang'e 6 spacecraft sent them back to Earth, and last week on Thursday, the return capsule re-entered the atmosphere and successfully landed under parachute in China's Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region. The China National Space Administration has reported that the mission returned 1,935.3 grams of samples from the Apollo crater, located in the South Pole Aitken Impact Basin on the far side of the moon. The samples have now been transferred to the Chinese Academy of Sciences, where researchers involved with the ground application system will later carry out work related to sample storage, analysis, and research as planned. Laon Aerospace was back in action last week for the final time, in Kerbal Space Program 2 that is. The developers were all officially made jobless on Friday and so there's now nobody left working on the game, so its development is effectively over. So there's not really going to be a lot of point in me continuing to play a game that has no real future. I was quite happy with how my farewell to the game came out, so do click that card on screen to it if it sounds good. Big thank you now to all the names on the left who support what I do here and make all of this content possible. You can sign up to my Patreon or channel member program to see your name in lights there as well. But that's it. Thank you so much for watching today's episode of Space This Week, and I'll catch you in the next one.